another list video thingy. So, you guys really seem to like my favorite Pixar villain video that I did. I did a big video talking about my favorite Pixar villains. Uh, and I had this idea of top 10 animated TV show villains for quite some time now. It got pushed a while. Uh, mostly because many things start, started happening around that time. You know, I got a lot of stuff to review and I Calgary Expo and all that stuff. And I just kind of forgot about it. But now I have made a, an official, my official, animated TV show villains. Um, so I was kind of going back and forth with it a bit because there are some that I really like and some that I recently have seen and that I really like. So it's kind of hard for me to choose. Uh, but now I think that I finally got it. So... By the way, this is my opinion, so if you, your favorite villain that you know is not high on my list, don't get mad at me in the comments. This is my personal opinion. So let's get into the top 10 animated villains. TV show villains, at least. You are strong, child. But I am beyond strength. I am the end. And I have come for you, Finn. The Lich, one of the most terrifying animated villains I have seen in recent years. They, they got away with so much stuff in Adventure Time, it's actually nuts that they actually didn't get cancelled. It's really hard nowadays to make a good TV show and then get cancelled before, you know, you try to finish it. Speaking of cancellation, we got Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. That was a really good TV show and he got cancelled. So I'm surprised that Cartoon Network... Cartoon Network is kind of notorious for canceling great TV shows, like Teen Titans, for example. Everybody loves Teen Titans. I haven't seen Teen, Titan Teen Titans, but I really want to. But I know that it got canceled after the fifth season, I believe, and they left it on a cliffhanger, and it hasn't been back in development since. So, yeah. So I'm glad that Cartoon Network even kept on going on with it. But anyway, that's not the point. I haven't seen all of Adventure Time, mind you. I have a Blu-ray upstairs. Uh, one of the seasons, I, I, I think it's season three or season four, can't remember. But the Lich is so terrifying. He's one of the most terrifying cartoon villains I've ever seen in my life. Um, he's kind of like the uh, the Horn King from the Black Cauldron. If you don't, uh, if, he kind of reminds me of the, the Horn. If you watch the Black Cauldron, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but what I really like about the Lich is his voice actor. Ron Perlman did a tremendous job. He also voiced Slade and T Titans, so two Cartoon Network villains, but Slate's not in this list, spoiler, because uh, I still haven't seen it. Uh, but Ron Perlman has this really sinister, smooth voice to him that every single time when the Lich or any of his char anime characters are on screen, you really feel like he's going to do something. They're going to do something to hurt the main character, and you don't want that to happen. The Lich is the complete opposite of what Finn is. Finn is all about good and protecting his world, and people that he loves. Fit, the Lich, on the other hand, wants to destroy every single life in existence. That's his goal. That's his main motivation. He wants to destroy everything. For fun, I guess. Like I said, I haven't seen all of it, so I don't know why. But what I can gather is that he just wants to destroy all of life because why not? So when Finn and the Lich are in the same scene together, you can really see that there are two polar opposite opposite characters going head to head and what if you really want to see finn win but you also kind of want to see the lich kind of not win so yeah um but the the lich just really wants to twist finn's arm because he wants to watch finn see everybody that he loves dies especially his world that's his that's what he wants he wants he wants to pry open finn's eyes and make him watch the chaos that he's going to commit so that's why he's at my number 10 spot. All right, let's get into number nine. <laughs> All right, so at my number nine spot, I have Finn from the Powerpuff Girls. I do not see the Powerpuff Girls, okay? But him is one of those type of villains that are just really creepy and, like, like I said, Cartoon Network, apparently. <laughs> Uh, but Powerpuff Girls also got away with a lot of weird and creepy stuff, especially with him. Um, so, 
all the villains in Powerpuff Girls, they're really just kind of bland and they're just kind of generic, in my opinion, at least. One of them is a monkey that wants to take over the city and the other just wants to see the Powerpuff Girls die. And But him, on the other hand, he's a really unique case because he is literally the devil himself and he's literally wants, he can, he wants to manipulate the Powerpuff Girls and turn their loved ones against them. That is really unique and somewhat terrifying. I'm pretty sure that everybody can relate. They do not want to see their friends and their family turn against them. So when him is manipulating and mind controlling the Powerpuff Girls, friends and family, and they're turning against them, that takes a really big toll on their mental health. And him is just laughing his ass off the entire time. And amazing. And especially with their fight with him where he turns into a giant, you know, lobster creature with like 20 different claws. And I'm pretty sure he has like three heads or something like that. Really weird and creepy. Very awesome too. So, yeah. And also, by the way, the Powerpuff Girls literally kicks him in the freaking face and blood stuff comes out. That's amazing. Man. Uh, so, I'm talking about the original cartoon, by the way. I'm not talking about the reboot Powerpuff Girls because the Powerpuff Girls reboot is... Yeah, it's not good at all. It's kind of cringe, actually. It makes me want to blow my brains out. But anyway, that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is to, you know, talk about animated villains. So, yeah. Him is just a really unique case. He's very weird, but also very cool, in my opinion. I also have a Funko Pop of him. Don't really see those much often. So, yeah. Let's, uh, let's move in to number eight. So, at my number 8 spot, I have Knopf from Blackbeard. Uh, Blackbeard is a recent anime I started watching a couple months back, and I'm kind of in love with it, not gonna lie. It's a very underrated anime. It's a French anime. It's all on Netflix, by the way. All, all three seasons are on Netflix. Uh, if you are going to watch it, just to let you know, it is a little bit cringe with the English dub, um, and also kind of cringe with the French dub as well. Um, but it takes a while for it to actually get good. I'm pretty sure, like, season two and then season three are where it actually gets good. Season one, not really great. I, I'm even surprised that I even stuck around with it. But the reason why I stuck around with it so much and why I continued watching it is because of Nox. Nox is one of those really strange, underrated villains that I have seen pop up really weird now. I've seen him, like, in people's top 10 lists and other, you know, cringe um, AMVs, and I'm like, who the hell is Nox? He, he has a really cool design, and I'm like, where is he from? So I started doing my own research where he's from, so I just kind of Googled weird robot with blue eyes TV show. And then Black Boo came up, and I realized that it was on Netflix. So I watched it, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, the first season is absolutely n notorious for being bad. But Knox is one of those strange coincidences that made me keep on going. Knox is a very, very sad villain. You really feel for him. And what I mean by that is that basically, I don't want to get into the whole lore of Black Boo, but basically, uh, his family. Uh, he was kind of going mad in his earlier years by discovering this magical cube, and he was trying to experiment with it, and he was kind of going mad because of it, and his family just kind of left him, and he was very sad that they left. So basically, he kind of wanted to gain as much Wakfu. Wakfu is kind of like the power of this world that is in Wakfu. So he wants to get as much Wakfu as possible so he can travel back in time and stop from his family from leaving. And... He is going to do it from any means necessary, and he'll do it. He'll kill the child if he wants to. That's how powerful, that's how eager and desperate he wants. And speaking of powerful, my god, he's one of the most powerful villains I've seen. He has so much power that he literally defeated a goddamn dragon lord. Who, who can do that? Who, nobody can. Apparently Nox can, because he's a goddamn demon, or god, whatever. But anyway... So, he's so powerful, in fact, that he literally killed a dragon lord, basically, one of the last dragons, powerful dragons at best, and he basically almost destroyed an entire civilization of people. 
just to get as much wackaboo as possible. And our main character tries to stop him, obviously, but guess what? He actually travels back in time. But not to stop his fan. Well, not going back into his earlier years, like a hundred years ago. He traveled 20 minutes. No, 20 seconds, I believe. 20 seconds ago. He has been going mad for almost 20 million. I don't even know how long he was going mad for. But I know that it was a lot. He was he, He's kind of morphed his body. And he's been going, he's been trying to collect as much wackoo, wackoo as possible. And once he got his, his motivation, his goal, and he uses it, he travels 20 seconds. And he literally goes insane. Wow. That literally, when I saw that final episode of season one, it literally gave me chills that he only traveled like 20 seconds. Because he doesn't even appear that much in the season, to be honest. He appears here and there, but you know that he's coming. He's coming to get that whack through, and he's going to do it at any means necessary. So, yeah, very underrated, appreciated villain, uh, but also a very underrated anime. For your fact, it is, if you are going to watch whack through, please just take a time. I'm pretty sure there's like only 24 episodes in each season. So please just take, if you're going to watch it, just take some time with season one. Uh, but you're going to appreciate that Nox is a great villain. And then afterwards, you're going to be like, all right, this is a great show. It's worth it getting past the horrible season of season one. So anyway, let's move on to number uh, seven. Yeah, seven. You, you should see the looks on your faces. Priceless. <laughs> I'm not a brony, and stop asking me! That's all I have to say. Anyway, so, Discord is one of those weird villains that he's in a TV show that is kind of cringe, but once he's once you watch those episodes while he's in it, he just steals the entire show. And he's one of those villains that he is made out of pure chaos. Legit. Lord of Chaos, obviously. He wants to turn Equestria into his playground, basically. And he's gonna do it through any means necessary. And but he's not gonna use his chaos power to wipe out our main characters and just take it right away. He is going to manipulate them and he's gonna trick with them very, very often. He wants to see them kinda he wants to play with them a little bit. He wants to trick them. And so he would rather play with his food than actually go for the main course, basically. So think of a plate, right? And Discord is like a tiny little child just playing with his food. And then after he's done playing with his food, he's just going to eat it right away. And then he's going to be like, I want more. That's pretty much what Discord is right there. And he's very, he has a very unique design. I have not seen an animated character that is very strange and very unique. He's made out of several, several different animal parts, which is kind of symbolizing his chaos nature because chaos is just all over the place and it's just a, it's a, it's a mixture of different things so it, that's a pure great way to do that um but yeah it's a very short section of this video there's not much to talk about discord um because he's just a great villain and everybody has made thousands upon thousands of videos talking about discord so i don't think i'm gonna add anything to this discussion but i just want to say why he's my favorite villain that's what this video is. I'm not going to get an in-depth character analysis. Like, I'm not going to study his freaking life and his death. That's for other peoples that have no life. So anyway, I have a life, so let's move on to number uh, six, shall we? All right, so at my number six spot, I have... Evil Morty from, obviously, Rick and Morty. I'm a pretty big fan of Rick and Morty. I have all five seasons on DVD. Um, and let's just say that it's a great comedy. I'm pretty sure everybody can agree with that. I mean, some people can agree with that. But most, at most, everybody can agree that the humor is pretty on the spot. But what really gets me and what me keep on going and going and going with the series is not because of the humor and the characters. And they're just, it's just a really unique show in general. But the fact that they introduced 
and villains at all. Mostly Rick and Morty, they go on adventures and they stop one guy in the most hilarious way possible. Like Rick will just shoot him in the face and be like, done, let's move, let's go home, time to go. But with Rick and Morty, that it actually had some twists and that's what Kit needs most because there was an actual plot going forward. Rick and Morty was just kind of like a sitcom and going through different adventures and types of stuff. But when Evil Morty showed up and the twist was starting to reveal that he was taking over the Citadel, that's when I was like, all right, I'm hooked. So Evil Morty, he is tired of being the Morty. He is tired of just being a Morty. He wants to be something more and he's going to do it in any means necessary. But he's going to do it in a really unique way. He is going to trick literally everybody, especially the Ricks. The Ricks are supposed to be the smartest man in the universe, right? But the fact that he tricked the entire Citadel into believing that he's going to turn it into something great, and then afterwards, he just destroys it and just says, screw it, and flies into a black hole. Who does that? That's amazing. And also, nobody knew that he was going to be a big bad. I mean, he's he, he, he didn't appear like Mason in the other seasons. But he did appear uh, in some of the seasons, like season one, I believe. I think he was in season one, season two, around there. can't remember. But everybody was really shocked that, especially the race, because everybody was like, way a Morty is going to become president. And he did it with swinging arms. And the fact is that, especially one scene that gives me chills, and I love it, is when he's you know, when he's in the room with the other Ricks and um, he's discussing something about uh, politics with sinister overtones. Just amazing. And basically, he's like, uh, do you guys agree with me or not? And the Ricks raise their hand and some of them don't. And the, those who don't, they get shot and they get injected out into the space. And the camera slowly frames us back and there's dead bodies everywhere. And especially his assistant, because his assistant knew that there was something wrong with him, something that was up. So he started to do some little research of his own, and he found out that he was working with one of the evil Ricks that was basically aligning a giant dome with Mortys and making them feel pain so nobody can detect them. And so basically after he found that, he tried to assassinate him, and sadly it failed. And he tried to tell everybody that that Morty, he's an evil dude, and he needs to be stopped immediately. And he just got ejected down to space, and all the information that he had with him is dead with him. And, by the way, Evil Morty even outsmarted Rick himself. Rick Sanchez, C-35-1. Like, how do you, you can't do that. He literally has a protective shield around him, and Rick tries to shoot him, and he's like, bro, I literally have a protective shield. I thought you were the smartest man in the universe. And he literally just blew up the entire Citadel, and he's left in a black hole. Amazing. There's nothing else to say. Well, actually, there's one thing to say. This theme is amazing, even though that it has been memed to death. I still really like it. I listen to it time and time again. It gives me nice motivation for nothing, because there's no motivation. Why would I listen to a bitchin' theme song when there's no point? Anyway, let's move on to number five. I don't know what that face search structure was. Let's just move on to number five, shall we? Soundwave Superior, Autobots Inferior. Alright, so at my number 5 spot, I have Soundwave from Transformers Prime. Um, so this spot was actually dedicated to three Transformer Prime villains. That would be Soundwave, Starscream, and Shockwave. But I feel like putting all three of them in one number 5 spot is just kind of weird because... I, I feel like I can make a entire video talking about Transformers Prime, which I might do, actually. I'm, I'm going to be doing more. Um, I have a Starscream Transformers Prime figure that I might do a review on. And maybe I'll talk about Transformers Prime and why I love it so much. Anyway, but so Soundwave. I decided to go with Soundwave than the other two, uh, mostly because I'm a big Soundwave fan. As you know, I, I love Soundwave. Um, there's a Funko Pop. And I also have some other figures up there. Anyway, but the reason why I decided to choose sound, uh, Transformers Prime Soundwave is because he is one of the best incarnations of Soundwave that I have seen. All of the other Soundwaves, I mean, nothing can beat the G1 Soundwave. We can all agree that Frank Welker did an amazing job playing Soundwave, and he was probably one of the best parts of the original cartoon. But Transformers Prime Soundwave, that they actually made him a completely different character. Um... Mm. He is very 
very he's very tall, he's very lanky, and he has no face, and he doesn't speak at all. And everybody can still say that is Soundwave, one hundred percent guaranteed. Soundwave in this show is a communications officer, like always, and he's also a spy as well with laser beak and everything like that. But what I really like about him is that a different take on the Soundwave uh, tour, I guess you could say. I don't even know what the, the hell that was. But they took their own spin on it because, because nobody has ever seen, until Transformers Prime, everybody knew Soundwave as, you know, a communications officer that could talk and everything like that. And he's loyal to Megatron. But Transformers Prime, Soundwave, he was very sinister and... He was very calculating and he was very smart and you didn't know what he was he was thinking because he has no face. So you could look him dead in the eyes, so to speak, or dead in the face, and you can't even see what you can't even tell what he's thinking because he has no face and he has no emotion. Um and also just want to let you know that the scene where he actually speaks for the first time is actually amazing. Um but yeah, just a really great villain in general. I mean he's not a main bad like Megatron or Starscream. But the scenes that he's in, really sinister and also really badass because he literally picks up a ragnet, a ragnet, which is basically one of the Transformers Prime villains that actually killed RC's partner, like right in front of her. And basically, she tries to take over the Decepticons, and Sour's like, "No, Megatron's Megatron's G. You can't do that." And basically, he just picks her up and just throws her aside. And he's like, and he's strong as hell, by the way. He can hold his own. He has these tentacles. Um, don't get the wrong idea. But he has these tentacles that you can use to hack, but he can also use them to get that way with his opponents. And he's really and he's really agile with his moves and everything. Just a really great villain in general. All the scenes that he's in is just amazing. But anyway, I think that we've dwelled uh, longer on Soundwave than needs to be. So let's move on to our number four spot. After all, I'm a businessman, not a villain. finished season three of DuckTales, and I gotta say, Bradford, pretty good. I'll, I'll give him 10 out of 10 for villainy. Um, because he is, he outplayed Scrooge McDuck at every turn possible. He was, he was manipulating and working behind his back through the entire show, and we just didn't know until the end of season two, because we, we, we all know that something was really weird and off about him at the first start, but then you found out that he was working behind Swiss McDuck's back a while before the show even began. And by the way, just want to let you know that he's very smart and very calculating with his moves, and he believes that he's he's right and he's doing good. And what I really like about villains is that they believe that they are right and they are doing good and they will achieve it any means necessary. Bradford believes that he's not a villain at all, despite all the villainous acts that he has committed against the, the McDuck family and all that. Um, but he he's just so naive that he will do anything to achieve it um, because he wants to get rid of adventuring forever because adventuring is too dangerous. And he believes that adventuring should be just stopped right then and there because adventuring is too dangerous and it causes more chaos and people get hurt every day and he wants to stop it right there. And he keeps on telling himself that I'm doing good and I'm going to do it right every single time. But once he grabs the sword of something, I forgot the name, that transforms into what he really is, then he starts to get really, you know, aggressive. He literally... Okay, just to let you know that this is a Disney show, right? With Disney characters that we all know and love, like Donald, Goofy, Scrooge. Um, I don't think Mickey, no, Mickey Mouse is not in it, sadly. But he literally is going to throw Donald into a vortex that will make him basically die. That make him erase from existence. So, yeah, that's going to ruin your childhood right there. Your childhood favorite Disney character is going to get thrown into a vortex that makes him die. God damn, that's horrifying. And 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 at the end, he he's like, God damn, I lost. Jesus Christ. And but all the villains are like, you're you're Scrooge's major villain. Come on now, get out of here. And he's like, but I'm not a villain. You've got to believe me. I'm not a villain. 
I even know that I almost committed genocide and murder. God damn. Bazemoff is not a villain. So that's what I really like about Bradford is that he's a recent villain that I started to like, but I also like that he's right, that he thinks that he's right, and that he's not a villain. Really unique spin on a character that we didn't even see in the original Dark Tales TV show because Bradford is a completely original character made for the show, and but he wasn't in the original show from the 80s. So, yeah, great job with that, guys. Anyway, let's move on to number three. I don't want your wand. Destroy it. All right, so at my number three spot, I have Hawk from uh, Star vs. the Forces of Evil. Star vs. the Forces of Evil. Uh, I'm just going to say Star vs. because that's a really long title that I don't want to say. So Star vs. is a really unique show. It's kind of like Gravity Falls. We'll get to that later. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's a really unique show, similar to Gravity Falls, but it's really unique because it's all goofy and weird and just really fun in general. Uh, the reason why Ludo is not on my list here is because he, he's not really a villain. He just wants to feel accepted by his family. So he just wants a wand, basically. He's not going to commit genocide against it, he, whatever. But Toffee, on the other hand, it's where the show starts to take a deeper and darker tone to an already goofy show. So he kind of adds a special little spice to the show, you know what I mean? He gets a little bit of spice. So... What I really like about him is that he adds so much character to him. I forget the voice actor who voiced him, uh, but he did a really terrific job voicing Toffee. And I haven't seen the show in quite a while, so my Toffee knowledge is a little bit rusty. What I really like about him is that he's very intelligent, and he doesn't want Stars 1 like Ludo. He wants to destroy it, and he wants to get rid of magic forever. He hates magic. Because, and also just want to let you know, he killed the main character's mother in cold blood. Who can do that? Nobody. Um, and he wants to get rid of magic forever. Pretty self-explanatory. And he, he's, he's, he's been with Star for quite a while now. Not just with her mother, but after Star defeated him. He's been with Star for a long period of time. And... Just an amazing villain in general. Very unique, very weird, and very awesome indeed. He's very strong, and he literally, he literally just crushes Star in his hand, basically. Star uh, is trapped, was trapped in one of a segment or a shard of her wand that Toffee had on his hand, and Star was trapped in there, and he just crushes it, and he just walks off. And he's very cold, and he doesn't show any emotion. When Ludo is like, do I, did I have any part to play in your plan? He just looks at him dead in the eyes and he just says, no. And he walks off. Just cold and just unfeeling because he basically won at that point. He believed that he won and also his death is absolutely terrifying. He turned into a goopy um, skeleton, basically. And then, guess what? Big pillar falls on him. And guess who did it? Mother freaking Ludo, baby! Let's go! So yeah, Ludo killed him, obviously. But he had a very unique spin on the show, oh. and he made the show a little bit enjoyable for me. Because if Toffee wasn't in it, or Ludo, or anything like that, I probably wouldn't get into the show. I probably just would have thought it was just for dumb babies. And now I'm a pretty big fan of Star Wars: The Forces of Evil. So yeah, let's move on to number two. I love you, Azula. I do. The reason why Zuko is not in this list is because Zuko is a redeeming villain. Villain. He just wants to capture the Avatar so he can make his father proud. But what I really like about Azula is that she's cold, she's calculating, she's badass, and she's powerful as hell. So let's talk about that. So Azula was introduced, I believe, in season one, around, no, season two. I believe in season two. And we get some pretty big backstory on her. She is very, there's a whole dedicated video, so I'm pretty sure about Azula and why she's so great. So I'm just going to talk about why I like her. Why I like her is because that she had a completely just a what moment in Avatar. Avatar was already dark and it was, had a really unique story. But when Azula came in, you 
know that the show was going into a darker route, and that's what I really like about it, is that when she shows up in season two, they're forward, she's going to make the show a whole lot darker. And also, she's just very, just cold. She doesn't have any empathy at all. And she's very good at lying. Toph, who is a very good um, knower of who's lying and who's not, she can't even tell if Azula is lying or not. So that takes some dedication. And she's powerful. She's very powerful. She's a very powerful firebender. Um, she'll do any means necessary. She has these really cool lightning um, fire, which is great. And she she will fake her enemies. She'll fake. She'll be like, all right, I'm surrendered. You got me. I know what I'm beating. And then she'll look around and make sure that everybody's paying attention to her. And then she'll go right for the kill. And basically go for the weakest one. So, and the one that has the most emotional attachment to our main characters, which is in this Cairo, um, grandfather to Zuko. And so basically she got him. But also because... She has no empathy. Like I mentioned, uh, Iroh's, grand, uh, uh, Iroh's son passed away in the war, and everybody was very emotional and heartbeat about it. But Zula was like, wow, he got all whiny and cried to his, and now he's retreating. A real general would stay and fight. Who cares if his son is dead? Like that type of stuff. She's very cruel to her brother. She's very manipulative, and she will do any means necessary to get what she wants. And you can't tell what she actually wants until she reveals what she actually wants. And not just directly telling you until you figure out yourself, which is great. She'll like, she'll be like, dad's going to kill you. And you'll be like, God damn, calm down. You're just lying. And then afterwards, you'll find out, oh, God, she, she wasn't lying. And she, she was right the entire time. And by the way, at the very end of Avatar The Last Airbender, you can see the sudden shift in insanity start to creep inside her. She was already kind of insane, but with a little bit of dignity to the people that she kind of cares about. But as the show keeps going, you find out that she's actually going insane, where she starts hallucinating about her mother, and then after she's defeated, she literally, she doesn't just cry, she literally just, she, she just goes all out and starts just, it's, it's, it's amazing. I love it. Just a really unique villain in general. Amazing. I love it. It's so good. Anyway, let's move on to the number one spot. Got some children I need to make into corpses. See you real soon. No, 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 no. no. Is because he is amazing and awesome. All right, so Bill Cipher is a lot like Discord. They both have similar powers and similar abilities, but with Discord, he's just like a child, like I mentioned, playing with his food, and he just wants to, you know, just play with his food. But on the other hand, Bill is playing with his food and also eating it at the same time. That, is, that analogy is the most terrible thing ever. But he really just wants to see you amid defeat right there and there. He'll trick you. He'll possess you. He'll do any means necessary to prove that you are wrong and that he is right and that he is going to do whatever he wants, no matter the cost. And what's really unique about him is his design. I've talked about really great and um, unique character designs and how simple character designs really stand out from the rest. Bill Cipher is no exception. That's like one of the most prominent examples that I can give. Bill Cipher has a really unique design. It's just a flowing triangle with a top hat and a bow tie and an eye and just two legs and two arms. Um, but that works for his character because he can turn into a weird flowing triangle and you don't know what he is. And then he's a full-blown monster and he's going to kill you if he wants to. He literally almost kills Mabel. He literally is playing a game with Dipper and Mabel. He's literally like, all right, guys, time's up. I feel like I'm just going to kill one of them just for the heck of it. And he just goes, eeny, meeny, miny, mo," And he's basically about to kill Mabel. And if he just snaps his fingers, she's dead. Done. And then Dipper would absolutely go mentally insane because of it. And he knows it. And what also means is that he, he wants you to... He wants you to... 
see that he is right, like I mentioned before, but but he has certain laws. He's not he's very powerful, but he has certain laws to him that he can't do. He can't enter your mind without making a deal and get information without you know faking a deal. And but but he he really just wants to get into Stanford's mind to get the code or not the code, but to get the equation so he can spread his weird get into the entire world and just be like a full blown par party. And speaking of powerful, he literally burns his entire dimension because he didn't like it. That means his friends, his family, and his entire dimension. You gotta think about it. how powerful do you need to be to destroy an entire dimension? You are more than a god. You are more than a deity. You are more powerful than anything in the entire universe. And he knows it, and he wants you to admit defeat. And also, he destroy and he kills the most powerful being in Gravity Falls, the Time Baby, which basically weighs over nine trillion tons. And he just goes like, "Bam, dead." Bye bye. So there's so many things I could talk about Bill Cipher, but Bill Cipher is just one of my favorite villains because he. I I started learning about him when I was like like 12 or whatever, and I just fell in love with him forever since because he was so unique and he was so weird, but something just gravitated towards me. He just gravitated towards me, and I don't know why. Maybe because he's a floating triangle, maybe because he's a badass, maybe because he's versed by Alex Hirsch. Who knows? Who knows at this point? It's an entire lore itself. Deep, deep down in my brain, I don't know why I like Bill Cipher, but I just gave you those reasons why. And also because Gravity Falls is one of my favorite TV shows ever made. So yeah, that's why he's at my number one spot. But anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this top 10 uh, animated TV show villains. I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said before, there is going to be an edit dedicated to this video, like the, uh, the Pixar villain one. So stay tuned for that whenever that comes out. But anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Like, comment, subscribe. I don't care what you do. Like, guys, I would type it. So... Bye, guys.